man. Yeah. I yeah. saw him, I think he was in a Western too at some point. Yeah, I don't know. I don't follow him like that, but on that okay. show, on Love, on definitely a good place, man. On Love Life is really mm-hmm. good. It's really good. I saw that to check it out. So should I just skip season one, go straight to season two? Yeah, because season two is the only one, uh, only season that stars him. And if you okay. look for blackness, then that's the one you want to watch. Gotcha. And you don't need to watch season one in order to watch season two. Okay, so it's kind of like Fargo. Yeah, because it, yeah, it has its own its thing own too. thing. Like it's not okay. a yeah, yeah. It's loosely connected, and you'll see how, and then it'll be like, yeah, oh, all right, and you'll be fine. Okay, cool. I got that. Well, that seems like a good place to start. We we're here with here's what I got. Um, and my guest for the first episode is my brother. My guest is Aaron catalyst alcinder um let me tell you something i i've read an article uh recently a wonderful article that was written about you uh at on nola.com mm-hmm. it was back in 2015 so about six years ago and it was just brilliant the way they they spoke about you and your life and why you do what you do um, there's stories in there about how you got your stage name, um, yeah. the, the, the name that they gave you that, uh, a, a famous poet gave you. I wanted you to talk about that a bit later too, but as part of your introduction, I really just want to tell people who you are uh, to me. Uh, we met on the set of Verses and Flow. I think it was season three. I think so. Yeah. I season think- three. And. Uh, you were, first of all, the way you were introduced to us were through visuals that you had made to your poems. And mm-hmm. I thought that was so dope back then because not a lot of people were doing that. So it lends to how I want to introduce somebody who, who loves to take chances uh, in life and on stage. And you are an empath and mm-hmm. you care about others. And we're going to get into these mental health Mondays that you have going on on Facebook that give others like a platform to share and simply just exhale if they need to do so. So I, I welcome Catalyst to Here's What I Got. Welcome, brother. Hey, thank you. Thank you for being. Sometimes I forget who I am and who I was, and I'm always trying. But for some reason, the smell of crisp fabrics pressed into stacks by hands as wrinkled as maps always seems to bring me tumbling home. It makes me think about my grandmother. And I don't know much about her. You see, our timelines didn't permit it as such, but I remember her smile could spin this world. If ever gravity decided to call in sick, I was told she was a real tall woman until diabetes made her a little bit shorter than me at age nine. Since the second grade, I've known what reality tastes like. It's the grandson cupping a kneecap like a baseball. It's the phantom stroke of two lost shins. And before she died, she told me, baby, sometimes I could still feel my toes. Thank you for letting me be on the show. What can I say? So let's, uh, let's just get into the story that I read about how you got your stage name, Catalyst, please. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, in middle school, I used to get in trouble a lot, like, at that point in my life, I was like, this sucks. I don't really want to be here. And, you know, things would happen in classroom where it's like, okay, cool. We're going to give you detention. So when I would get detention in detention, they would make you write out of the dictionary. And I, I love reading. Like, I still love reading. I was very voracious with my reading. So I was like, the thing that would make us do is like, okay, start with A and you go with Aardvark and you would have to write the definition of that, that, that. And you'd be there for like, uh, if you had like a weekend suspension, you have to come in and sit there for like an hour or so, two hours. Or if you had an in school, you'd have to sit there for like 30 minutes or something. And I, I got into a point where I was just like, I'm not writing this. This is ridiculous. I was just starting to read the dictionary. And so I just kept reading and finding words I really enjoyed. And I saw the word catalyst and I really was like, I like this. I'm going to keep this. And I just, kept it in my brain for as long as I had. And uh, throughout time, of course, you know, you graduate, you go to a different school, you graduate that, and then uh, you start figuring out what you want to do. And I remember I was starting, <laughs> I was starting to date and 
there was this woman I was seeing and she was like, you, you always writing in that notebook. You should probably read that stuff. And I was like, I don't really know. And I remember that we went out to this open mic and they were doing an open mic. And she was like, you should, you should sign up. I was like, what am I, I don't want to do that. And she ended up putting my name on the list. You know, and she spelled, she spelled it the way that is my, my actual name. And I was like, well, if I go up there, I don't want to use my real name, do something else. And she was like, okay, what do you want to do? And so I remember that word and I just was like, there, there you go. And so I, instead of spelling it with a C, I spelled it with a K, but then I saw that, you know, people, you could Google that and be like, oh, there's Catalyst, there's a Catalyst set. And I was like, well, why don't I put two A's? And I was thinking about it and I was like, like the, the person that really got me into reading and writing and becoming the person that I really wanted to be was my mother. And so I decided to put the two A's in my name as a memory for her because her name was Agatha Alcinder. So from there, I just put the double A and we were just off to the races. And that's how I got my name. So you did all this that first night that you got on stage? Well, was that over time. Well, I started with the original and then I saw that somebody else was trying to do that. So I was like, how can I differentiate myself? So by the next time I went up there, which wasn't like I went up and I spent like every night I, I would go, but I would never really perform. I just went for the first night and I got really nervous, but then I got the bug. And then I started to just kind of like lay back and see, how do you do this thing? <laughs> so by the time that I went up again, I had decided yeah I should probably use that so yeah I'd say maybe the second or second or third time so for those who when you when you talk about open mic he, he, he is a poet he is a spoken word artist and so yeah. that was kind of like his origin story uh mm -hmm. saying the things that were in your notebook and so do you remember the first poem you said on stage no no wow um I knew that it was very like black driven. I think the name of it was black and it talked about the beauty of things that are that color and how does that impact certain people? But yeah, I, I think it was just like that. And I had a piece of paper and my hands were shaking like trembling. And, but if I could, if, I couldn't recall the, the, the full poem, but yeah, I think it was related to just like the color black and the denseness and the meanings of all of what does that mean to be? Uh, in the in the article that I read uh, on NOLA.com, that there were so many people that they spoke to for the article that just talked about how amazing you were in that moment, um, using the music and, and using everything around you to get your words out and get your points across. So I'm really curious, you're, you were there, but how did you find your voice? How did you find your, your way? Of, spoke, of doing spoken word? Um, observation, honestly. Like, I remember growing up in a Black Baptist church and then seeing my pastor and being like, that's cool. I don't really agree with what y'all are saying, but I like the way that you say it. And then, you know, you grew up on James Brown. Like, my dad would play these artists that were really, like, bombastic. They would really be, like, in your face. And so when I saw that, I was like, wow, that dude really knows how to put on a show or that dude really knows what to say what on his, what's on his mind, you know? And you grow up and you hear like Michael Jackson's bad. And it, it's not like, you know, the Jackson five, this is like rock star, Michael. Like I'm mad, here's why, Michael. And I saw that as a kid too and was like, that's a black man? <laughs> like, Cause at that point you didn't know Michael's black, but. <laughs> you were wrong for that. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Let's be real. But he he had a way of saying things and doing things. And I really loved that style at first. Like, and of course, when I went to the open mics, I would see poets that were just leaps and bounds beyond what I was trying to do. I had no idea about like stage presence at the time or just kind of like taking the temperature of the room or figuring out what you want to say before you say it. It was just, I want to say this thing and I want attention. But 
the more I watched and observed these different poets get up there night after night, I started to realize that there is a way of saying things and doing things and speaking to people that you have to take account of for you to be a really good artist. And I, I just was so blessed to be in the city of New Orleans at the time where there was so many artists that were just like, yeah, we do spoken word and we do this for a living and we care about our community. And that really impacted the way that I am today and the poet that I'm still trying to be. Yeah, and that blends right into what I was going to say next, because those poets uh, in the city of New Orleans, where you are from, um, they grew to to love your presence and your words. And, and one artist, uh, Sonny Patterson, very uh, famous poet, uh, she said that Catalyst is kind of like a quiet storm. In a martial arts movie, he would be like those little pinpoints that are deadly. I like that about him, that he's not a yeller. Now, when I met you, you had found yeah. your voice where you were like, you, you roared uh, when you gave your poems, but to have that, those nuances down where you did not have to yell to get your point across is I guess what Sonny was talking about. So where did you learn how to get your variances and how did you um, learn to really just like modulate and, and make sure that people heard you without you having to go crazy with it? Well, first, shouts to Sunny, because she's probably one of the first people that I learned that from. She, man, poof. If I'm a quiet storm, that woman is a hurricane. And, <laughs> like, the, the eye of it. <laughs> that woman is powerful. New Orleans, Sunny Patterson. So I'm from a stock that pitched cocktail bombs and hand grenades. We pour cayenne pepper around the perimeter of a building to keep the police dogs at bay. I'm the Panther Party in a desire housing projects in New Orleans. I'm a nigga turning the gun on the National Guards. Take a long, long look. I'm a cook in the kitchen asking the missus to taste the dinner. Take a long, long sip, cause death ain't always this good. It's eyes popping out they sockets. It's a lifeless body rocking backwards and forwards. It's a boy standing have 47 times in front of the church house. It's a man 43 years old stuffing his penis in a nine-year-old girl's mouth. No, death don't always taste good. Just don't sound like something I want to eat often. I um, but I did learn that from, again, the people that you are talking about. Um, <clears throat> when I got into the scene, I was really, really angry with the things that I had been through as a child. And I found that spoken word was a place for me to vent some of those frustrations to people that actually want to hear what I have to say. But the more I did it, the more I realized I exude a lot of energy putting that into that. And I had to learn how to learn to pace yourself. Well, not, ne not necessarily pace myself, but change the caliber of ammunition that I'm using. Like I can be a cannon or I can be a laser and they're both still impactful. It really depends on what type of damage that I'm trying to do. And that's where you learn how to do that stuff. When you go to open mics, you hear different poets, you go and read different things and you observe certain things. Like a lot of the things that I started to do when I was on stage, I was learning from watching TV because acting and all that other great stuff, but also listening to certain people that are not actors. Like, people that are on the street corner. Like if you are uh, like a pastor or someone that's like a corner store preacher or like busker or someone that's like in the public trying to get someone's attention, there's a certain way of going about it and a certain tone of energy that you use. And when you're 16, 17, pent up aggression, you got poems and you're, you know, big stocky black guy, like people look at you like you could be dangerous and it's important to one appear not dangerous um to certain friend random people but also to get your point across because you do need to be taken seriously and do be looked at as a human and not just some beast that they think you are like i think half of what i do comes down to the appearance of not being violent but also speaking about something that is 
I care about deeply. And nobody wants to listen if you're screaming in their face. Don't get me wrong. Like I grew up as a person that was like, I'm going to scream. I'm like, no one understands. But when I looked around, I had to realize people do care and people do understand and they want to listen to you, but you don't have to, you know, you don't have to scream at them. Like they actually, they actively are here to listen. That's what they pay their money for sometimes. Like they, they want to come and see you. They care about what you say. They, they think strongly about the thing that you wrote. And, you know, sometimes certain poems do call for that, but not every poem calls for you to do that. And that's half of like just learning from your elders, like watching other poets and other artists do the same thing that I do, but in certain ways, it always astonishes me. Like it always brings me back to the base of like, man, these people are simply just amazing because of who they are and the things that they have to say, but it's the way you say certain things that can make people just gather around you and want to hear more. And after years of finding your voice and being able to master your presence on stages, uh, what, what, is, what is coming up next for you? I think you have something that you're, you're doing out of the country. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be um, collaborating with a uh, Amsterdam art group that's happening in the May, and I'm really in looking what? forward. In the May? Did you say in the, the May? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I don't know my brain, man. Uh, it's happening in May. Um, May. But that was poetry. I didn't know what you was doing there. But go ahead. You got. It. Yeah. Yes. So, um, I was previously in Amsterdam to do a show, um, and from that point, I got some art sent to certain festivals there, and. They reached out to me and said, hey, we want to do a show with you and we want to bring some people down with you. So if it's possible, let's let's do that. And so now um, we've been planning to curate a show um, like what does it mean to be black from Louisiana, New Orleans? And um, I decided that I, to gather other poets that I really admire and say, hey, I want to bring these poets with me so you can see other perspectives of what is it? feel like and i'm really excited about it and I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing that with those poets man they're they're well deserving and pretty awesome so uh, for work are you a teacher no i'm i'm just a poet <laughs> like, okay yeah i'm a grant uh, i try and write grants so i can get more opportunities to go and perform and get other uh, other artists opportunities for them to go and perform but yeah art is my, my main gig like, I'm really excited about that. That's something that I really want to jump straight forward into since the pandemic. So I knew you were you were an artist because when I met you, we were literally living in an art museum. So I, I do recall that. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you is about, speaking of art, the city of New Orleans, what was it like growing up there and how has it molded you? Well, I mean, here's the kicker. Like, a lot of my life was spent around New Orleans, not just New Orleans. So if I'm to be honest, I grew up more of my life on the West Bank, which is Marevel, Louisiana. And that is more um, like a rural situation as opposed to like the city construct. Um, though I think the majority of my adult life, I've lived in New Orleans, but to say that I'm from there is kind of like, yes, but man, I want to respect all the places that I've been, but, um, but I can definitely give you some some great stories about that. Like I think one growing up on the West Bank in Marrero was a very uh, tough city to grow up in. Like it was predominantly black, uh, white, and Vietnamese. Um, there was a church every couple of blocks. Um, can I say TGIF was on? Step by Step was a great show. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, but it was really tough, man. There was a lot of drugs. There, there were definitely a lot of uh, violence. I remember there was a, this might be too much, but like there was a moment where we were doing a sleepover with our neighbors, uh, the boys. We all came uh, came over to the house and we were like playing Larry versus uh, Jordan on Sega Genesis and stuff. And there was a uh, some kind of situation happening outside we didn't know about and then all of a sudden i remember we ran to the kitchen for something 
And there were police outside. We were like, what is going on? So we were like, hey, mom, something's going on outside. And she went out there and was like, there was someone dead outside by our, like our, our, our mailbox. And that was like an everyday thing sometimes. Like there would just be shootings or some kind of scuffle. Like, mind you, we, we lived in a suburban place, but it was still crazy. Like it, it didn't make a lot of sense, but there was always like that. And then you would have, oh, let's do a pickup football game or let's have a barbecue for the baby who just was born. It was this mixture of kind of like good and terrible. Like it, it's a, it's a, I don't know. Like it's, it's very like Southern Americana. Like we grew up not far from this black cowboy who had his stables in the woods that was like three blocks away. And it wasn't like crazy, but it was something that was definitely not traditionally, I, I guess like, what you would think when you think New Orleans. It, it would definitely be some like, this is some Southern shit. I wouldn't say it's country, but it's definitely some Southern something. It's weird. Like it's Cadillacs and, and like dudes with boots on and gold teeth. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like cowboy boots. <laughs> yeah. Was, yeah, it was like, oh, okay, this is different. <laughs> it's like a Southern rodeo situation. I don't know how to describe it. So how did that inform who you became? Um, it's a really good question. I, I guess it was just about the community that I grew up with, the parents that I had and the family that I was raised in. Um, a lot of those are Southern Baptist people, you know, both of my parents had like dope cars. <laughs> like they, my mom used to have this white Mustang before we were even born. And my dad had like a white uh Lincoln like a stretched Lincoln but he was a cab driver so it was orange so I I think it was just both of them had a some kind of style about them that they knew that they were strongly independent people who were never forgetting that they were black but they also had this thing about them where they were just like yes we are black but we're also people so we need to care about other people that's just not black we need to care about people just in general and they stood up for themselves and they gave people this opportunity to prove themselves and redemption stories here and there and like family really mattered and it i don't know it just gave me this understanding about okay believe what you you need to believe to be the person that you really are trying to be um so you what i love about your poetry is that it, it always feels like it's it's grounded in family, uh, grounded in history, uh, grounded in in stories about that family and about that history. Uh, there were, and I don't know if this was a poem or not, but I know one time you said you told a story about your father in a cat in the cab. Uh, yeah. Do you remember that? Share that. Oh, with me. yeah, I think yeah, because we were writing that thing. Um. Oh man, I'm trying to pull it up. I'm trying to figure it out in my brain. I, <laughs> Got a lot of stories about my dad and his cab, but I'm I'm trying to figure out which particular one that you're trying to you're trying to find. Um, I remember he really cared about that cab because it was something that he was prideful of, mind you. Um, I think we take for granted a lot of people that just do jobs that aren't so glorious. Like my mother was a secretary, and my father was a cab driver, and it it meant a lot because this was way before the time of like Google maps and like any of that, like, like Lyft, Uber, any of that. And he really was a man that was like, I know where to get to, how to get there at what time to get there. And it's pretty rare nowadays. He, he was someone that also served for his country, but he really was an independent thinker. He always wanted to do his own thing. And that cab was something that he really embodied. Like he really was just like, look, I may work for this company, but I make this company work for me. And I never really forget that stuff. He took a lot of pride in also it just being clean. Like I, 
He had the, like he had a a Lincoln that was so old it still had those the metal ashtrays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where well, they would burn you when you got out of church. <laughs> that and the seatbelts, they were they were insane. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. Oh. See, um, but yeah, he he cared a lot about it. He he showed you like pride in appearance. Like he he really was always making sure that his clients felt comfortable because he was him and the car was nice and people feel good about that. Like when you take pride in what you're presenting, it's something that I carry with me, especially when I put, I try and put it in my poems where I put a lot of work into it because I know there's a lot of details that if you glance over it, you might miss, but they're, they're polished for a reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want them to be admired because I cared a lot about this. All right, I got two more names for you. I'm going to throw out there, and I want you to tell me the first thing you think about when you think about these names. You ready? Ready. Agatha, go. Ooh. Uh, ooh, purple, for sure. Um, oof. Uh, abundance. Uh, there's this goddess named Yimaya, who is like the mother of many fish. And when I think about that goddess, I was thinking about my mom because she was always a mother to people that needed a mother. Like she was my cousin's mama before they, she was my mom. And she worked at a high school that was full of kids that would always call her uh, Grandma Agatha or Mama Agatha. And uh, I feel like if she was still alive, she'd still be working even though she shouldn't. But yeah, that's what I think when I think about that word. All right, next name. Errol, go. Errol. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, oh, stubborn. Uh, <laughs> twin brother. Twin brother. Let's get that out. Go ahead. Twin, that's twin brother. Um, stubborn for sure. Um, caring, but oh man, like knuckleheaded. Uh, stylish. Um, yeah, man. And I think just a, just a overall strong hearted man, good guy, but man, oof, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you were just coming of age when, when Katrina hit, you were probably like 17, 16, 17, 18 around that age. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, Perfect. I need to drink now. <laughs> and and there were there's this one poem that you might be most known for or it got a lot of run it's called greater than hurricanes yes uh, it's a tribute to the city of new orleans and how it bounced back from that that hurricane katrina but also it could apply for what happened you know in 2021 so yeah. tell me what went through your mind when you were putting that poem together um, bet. Yeah. So I was currently with a, uh, company called, uh, evacuteer.org. So they are, and I, I believe they're still existing. They are a volunteer company, uh, nonprofit who accept and train local New Orleanian residents to help other New Orleanian residents to evacuate the city of New Orleans in the event of a hurricane. And when they decided that they wanted to do something like create an event for it, they reached out to me and said, hey, you're a poet. I know that you work for us, but can you create something for this event? And I'd looked at that as a perfect opportunity to create this poem that I've been thinking about, because I believe that a lot of poems are just tributes to people and places. And I've never really heard something like oh here's a big grandiose thing but I remember growing up in cities like New Orleans and then seeing poets and being like this city has a lot of pride to it and we need to document both sides of just being in the city um, and of course growing up in spoken word open mics I heard poets write about this city and then trying to use what they've been through to create art and being from uh, 
the West Bank, the Marrero, but living in New Orleans is like a big, it's like a, like a sibling rivalry thing. And I, I said, I wanted to put that stuff to the side, but I wanted to give an honest take on what it is to be in a city that's kind of like living in a circus. Like things just never turn off here sometimes. We do have 24 hour things um, and the events are plenty. Um, and I wanted to document just the greediness of the city, how the perseverance of the city is and acknowledge that the city is going to survive in the near and, and always present future. Um, and I'm, I'm just grateful that it, they got the opportunity to be filmed and put on somewhere. Um, yeah, and from that point, I've been rocking with this poem. Like there was an event that happened for evacuate.org. They had me on stage. I wrote the poem and uh, read the poem, excuse me. And uh, I, I, it was always a thing that I'm like, okay, now I have to keep this in my brain for the rest of my life. <laughs> so are there parts that you, you kind of like uh, ad lib now or do you remember the whole poem? Well, yeah, I remember the whole poem, but I remember being in a point where I remember this was two different things. Like I remember the first part of the city, uh, the first part of the poem that I wrote was supposed to be in a whole different poem. And I saw the second part come in because we have Mardi Gras and I wanted to specifically write stuff about Mardi Gras in this poem. So I just kind of waited for it to happen so I can experience Mardi Gras like as a, as a person. And of course, growing up here, you get to experience Mardi Gras in any way and you know, any given time, but there's something about being in the city while Mardi Gras is happening. So you can get visual things of like, okay, I should put this in here. Okay, that thing is happening. And yeah, that's, that's kind of how it, how it started. And from that point, again, like I have to keep this in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> we are not idle warships with punctured sails and windless lungs. We are anchors standing on our toes when the tide comes rushing back to crack us in the chest. I'm from a city full of Saturday night sinners and Sunday morning saints. And I'm here to tell you, our Indian dances don't bring no rain. These hands have mixed martyr and play taps in the same day. We do not fear water. We no longer fear death and refuse to be scared by the whispers of a maelstrom. And even though you can't see through our umbrellas, know that we're smiling on the other side. In a city where we celebrated home, we gather here tonight toasting the ending of a season, laying to rest the fears of another knock at our doorstep, remembering to raise our glasses in honor of all the once living angels never to forget the reason why we chose to rebuild the city that America forgot. Tonight is for the survivors, for the stayers, for the men with the balls the size of Sean Payton, for the long shots, for the freaks, for the burlesque dancers painting themselves gold in the cold of December, for the artists, for the dreamers, for the pursuers of the future, and the who that Sundays and Red Bean Mondays, and all those brass bands blowing under the bridge. Tonight, tonight, it's for New Orleans. Tonight, tonight, it's for you. Another thing that uh, I saw you earlier this year, back in August, um, but the last two years really have been about a, a lot of monumental loss. It's been a lot of, there's been a need for us to be mentally strong in order to get through everything that's happened because it's stuff that we have never experienced before. You know, me personally, just yeah. since August, I've gone through a lot. Uh, of loss like my mom last year a baby cousin uh one of my really close friends uh, like uh, my brother so there's so much loss and what i what i've loved since the pandemic started is how you on facebook have put together the mental health mondays checking in on people because you just never know what people are going through uh, just tell the audience what has been to the response to that and what made you think of doing it so the response has been surprisingly like big. I, I didn't know that it was gonna be a thing like this. I remember seeing it being like, that's a cool thing. I should probably start doing that. And then I think it was just for me, a way for me to, to also check in with my own mental health. Like I'm a person that struggles with PTSD. 
And for, for me, I always have to remind myself that, yeah, this thing that you went through, you're not really going through it right now, but you still have lasting um, residual effects of that. And it's important to always acknowledge that because it helps figure out your feelings. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves feelings aren't facts, but they are worthy of being respected. And I ultimately, I didn't want to be alone in that. I wanted someone to at least acknowledge, yeah, I got stuff going on. Um, and I always want to acknowledge that I'm not a doctor. I am, I was, I'm just a dude that deals with mental health. And it's important for there to be a community around that because there's always someone struggling. Um, and I wanted to create space for that. Like, I didn't want to just be a, some dude that's like, oh, I'm an artist, yeah, and I'm a cool artist, so I'm gonna just hide my emotions. Like, I really wanted there to be talks about, hey, I go through this. Oh, I go through this. Oh, really? I didn't know. That's cool, hmm. man. And just have an opportunity for people to speak. Like, I think what divides us the most is the things that we keep from one another sometimes. And when I saw this thing, I wanted people to feel welcome. I wanted people to understand that you, you aren't the only person dealing with grief or pain or stress or anxiety or, you know, the thoughts of debt and bills and children trauma and, you know, like trafficking or sexual issues. Like I didn't want that, the, I didn't want there to just be this space where you couldn't express yourself. And it, I didn't know that it was something that people were actually paying attention to until I started going back to like community open mics or like festivals when I was starting to perform again. I, I remember walking into a festival and someone pulled me to the side and was like, hey, I want to thank you for the mental health check-ins that you do. And it just kind of blew me away. I didn't really know that people were paying attention to that stuff. I honestly was just like, hey, man, it's Mental Health Monday. How are you feeling? What's going on with you? And people started taking to it. People started inboxing me and saying, like, they wanted to do this or they needed help with that. And I, I wanted to give people more opportunities. So I'm glad that it started taking off because uh, originally I was, I just didn't maybe I didn't want to write that day like I, I don't think that I, I ugh, sorry getting wrapped up in my words um I, I look at Facebook and Twitter and things like that as a tool for me to write I remember when it was like 140 calibers just to write in Twitter and I thought that was a challenge and I really liked that challenge of like how do I express myself in that and I looked at Facebook and every day there's a question was like, how do you feel or what's on your mind before you type on the thing? And I didn't really feel like I wanted to write, but I did want to hear about how the people felt. So it became a thing. And man, I'm, I'm really glad that it's helping somebody or at least it's giving people opportunity to, to say how they feel. Now, what, now we talked about before what people could be going through because of the last two years, but what are some of the more surprising things that you've you've heard from people, no names, of course, but what have you, what is the surprising thing that you heard that you said, oh my goodness, they might really need professional assistance? Um, someone talked about not wanting to exist anymore. Mm. They didn't live anymore. Um, some people talked about homelessness of them not having a place to stay. Um, I, I, and for all of those, moments i'm grateful for the opportunity that people feel comfortable saying that stuff but i immediately want to be like okay how can we help this person like what do you need here's i will I remember there was one where there was a guy that felt really low and i sent him information on like the suicide hotline and it was something that i i didn't think i'd ever be doing but i'm glad that i had the information on me to give to that person and I don't know you know you just never know what people are going through until you ask and I'm glad that sometimes when I ask some people really say what they need and if I'm able to help I can help them 
but yeah, there, there's been some surprises sometimes. It's not just, oh, my kid, and oh, man, I feel bad about this. And, like, sometimes people will really, if you give them a shoulder, they will use it. And I'm glad that people can use it. But, you know, you never know. Sometimes it, it can be drastic. Well, I know you, and I know that uh, you have the, the biggest heart in the world. So I, I applaud you for p- providing that space. And, of course, people are going to, to be able to trust you with their words because you, you are a master of words yourself. So I, I thank you for opening up that platform. I know there's some money that I'm like, hey, man, I'm just barely holding on myself. And, uh, you know, so being able to just say that when you don't have any other outlet is is a big deal so um we've we've come to uh, the end of the episode but before you go i got three things and i like to call this round the the title of the show here's what i got so i want you to there are three things here's what you got to tell people right so for you the first one is here's what i got what would you tell people that would want to get into spoken word listen to spoken word (laughs) <laughs> I know there's a lot of people that jump in spoken word and they say, oh, this is going to be my big ticket to whatever, whatever, but study your art, study your art. I think that a big thing about spoken word is that it's very underappreciated, although it's been going on for centuries. Um, yeah, study your art, learn about certain poets, read books, <laughs> read books, <laughs> please, please. Read about different poets that you've never heard of and acknowledge certain ones that you have. I think just take from what you love and use the things that you love to be the person that you are. Like, I, I think spoken word for sure is underappreciated. And I think more people should be well versed in their favorite spoken word. Here's what I got. What would you tell people that are coming to visit your city? Ooh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> please, please. Just don't feel like you need to rush into everything because that's a quick way to end your race, man. Um, drink water. Drink water. Um, uh, buy black. Experience POC stuff. Um, go beyond Frenchmen and Bourbon Street. Like, go to places that's not traditionally what you think about New Orleans is, visit there and spend money with people that you really like and trust and fuck with. Like, <laughs> and don't be a dick. Don't, don't come here with the attitude that you think things should change because you're here. You came here because you want to experience what this culture is, experience it. Don't be someone that's overbearing, respect the culture. And yeah, enjoy yourself. But don't walk over people that exist here. Like half of this city are people that are working jobs to, to keep the city going. Like respect people that are blue collar workers and tip, <laughs> and tip please. All right, lastly, here's what I got. What is your message for the world? Man. That's a big one, man. That's why I saved it for life. That's a big one, man. Um, hurt people, hurt people. So heal and be healed. Okay. Yeah. Acknowledge mistakes and faults. Realize that no one's perfect. and Take everything with a grain of salt. Um, unless you got high blood pressure, because then you don't want to do that. You, you got high blood pressure. <laughs> Lay off. <laughs> Lay off the image. Too much, you know. Too much. Um, acknowledge, acknowledge how you feel and respect people who are still just trying to be the best person that they can be. And also attempt to be the best person that you can be. Like a C is still passing. Mm-hmm. You don't have to always try and get A's, but definitely try and do better than F's. Yeah. Aaron catalyst alcinder the two a's and catalyst are his mama name so you better remember that when you come to new orleans you 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 take your time drink water but go see this man perform if you can i will put up his youtube link so you could just just see 
what a force he is. He is a quiet storm, uh, as they call him in the city uh, that he lives in presently. Um, you have grown into a great man. So I thank you for giving us what you got today. And I appreciate your time, brother. 